And I'll be a bit mischievous again because I like being mischievous. Oh, dear. You probably noticed. What a great time to do rock, paper, scissors to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Nathan's face. Oh, my God. He's shaking his head at me. <laughs> we did the rock, paper, scissors. Let me do it. <laughs> Perfect. That's, that's a can of worms that you've just gone. <laughs> Right then, welcome to episode five of The Final Whistle with Ant Martin and Nathan. Uh, gentlemen, hello uh, once again. Uh, welcome back. Thanks, uh, Ant. It's really good to be uh, back and talking about this again. Uh, as, as, as suggested, we are becoming increasingly popular with, with this vlog and we have hit 10,000 overall views. Uh, across all platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Um, in We've only released three full episodes, and I think that's... Woo, don't want to blow my own trumpet too much. But one of the things that comes back off this um, is that we are starting to get direct feedback from people who watch this. Uh, people have questions about what we're talking about. And uh, one guy, I won't, I won't name names or anything like that. I'll, I'll keep it anonymous. But he dropped me a message last night about the um, uh, part three, episode three, where we're talking about uh, foul language on the, on the pitch from players. And um, he had a question. Uh, I'll, I'll read it pretty much word for word. Uh, this young man says, just watching your video, what do you send off for, for language and what do you caution for verbal dissent? So I replied to him, in the video, we say it depends on who the, the language is targeted at. He said he's referring to when it's at the referees. Uh, and then he asks, is it every time it's at the referee, do you send off? I'm confused by Nathan saying, take action. What does this mean exactly? So I clarified, it's any position on the stepped approach to game management. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, that's anything from a quiet word, stepped all the way up through to a stern word, a yellow card, a dismissal. Um, uh, so that's what I said. He said, he knows an assessor. This year, this guy's going from seven to six. The assessor marked seven to six and he did fitness training together. He was giving him advice. And he said, last year, someone had a great game but then lost marks due to a missed red card. Uh, he asked them what it was for. The assessor said offensive language. Then he said the referee told him that it was not heard and the assessor said, you did hear it because you went up to the player and told him to calm down, but you didn't send him off. Gentlemen, your thoughts? I think we all know um when we hear raised voices and aggression and things like that, that, you know, words get had on a football pitch uh, between players towards officials, whatever it might be. Now, when you're refereeing a game, you're concentrating on whatever's happening in that particular moment and your eyes may be not on it and things like that. So you might not see gestures or you might not hear the specifics, which is, what I'm imagining probably did happen in this situation is they've heard some sort of raised voices, aggression, whatever you might call it, words being had. But unfortunately, uh, you know, and they've wanted to deal with that as a referee, but unfortunately they haven't heard the, the full content of, of actually what was said in terms of the specific words. But obviously you want to try and maintain a good level of match control when you're getting observed because it's one of the key points, isn't it? So, so it's been seen to tackle anything that, that, that could threaten your match control would be a good thing. You, you know, you'd think you were doing the right thing, but there's always that, that thing that you might trip up on if, if, if you have not actually heard the full context of the exchange um, and then you can get punished for that. So I think that's something that, you know, maybe um, could have been considered by the observer, I, th I think maybe, or the, or the referee could have told the observer that maybe. I, I, I don't obviously know the full ins and outs of that situation, but but that's what I'm kind of surmising because, I, you know, it's obviously it's happened to myself as well where you hear something and you know something's happening, but you don't understand the, the full specifics of it. 
we, well, it was me and um, Dave Brammer did a presentation on this to an RA, and it went on all night. We could probably talk about what offensive and sort of abusive language is in the context of a game in relation to what did be heard or how you did it. And we had this big long list and it went on from what time was it? Who was it at? How loud was it? Did just you hear it? Did everyone else hear it? Was the gestures in it? How long was left? And when you touched about um, in the intro, Anthony, when you said, Nathan said, deal with it. I think any sensible person will say that. And I'd, I'd, I'd say that he right up to, to Neil Barry and people like that would say, just deal, don't ignore it. Any good assessor will say, don't yeah. ignore it, deal with it. Because if we deal with it, is, was it his first way away in that game? Was it his, his last? Was it just a blast of frustration? Because I'd say now, shoot me down for it. If it's a burst of frustration, you deal with it. Like you said, you, you, you said, Nate, deal with it. Maybe get the captain over, do that, do that, you know, that step to post, like Anthony yeah. said. But the one thing that you, that, we need to understand this, which might have gone wrong here, is I don't believe there's anything called a quiet word in football. There's a practical advice for referees that we want to do on this, this blog. You have, you have a public word and you have a quiet word. The only difference between a public word and a quiet word, in my opinion, and I've coached this, is that one is the game is still going on and one, the game, you're going to stop the game and do a ceremonial polyping. Now, a quiet word if you, if, who's it for? Is it just for you and him? And then if it is for you and him, how, how would an assessor know you dealt with it? So therefore, if no one sees a quiet word, it's an absolute waste of time. So a public admonishment is, psh, stop the game, come here, bring over the captain. And when you're talking to the, to, to the situation, talk to the captain and say to the captain, because you haven't called him over to talk to him. Talk to the captain and say, if he doesn't shut up, he's going to get binned. And what I've found with coaching referees, just don't acknowledge him. He's had his chance. Say to the captain, he's going to go if he doesn't want to talk to him. And make sure the captain says something to him. It's nothing worse than calling the captain over to, to bollock a player. <laughs> and then they both don't say anything to each other. And they both run away. They're like, hang on a minute. What's the point in that? So escalations of quiet words, public admonishments. Make sure everyone sees what a quiet word is. If the game's going, not like people do in advantage. You play in advantage and they always want you to say, you know, point back, make a gesture to say, I've seen it. Make a gesture to say, hey, I'm coming to you in a minute. Set up signals. It's exactly the same with managing and addressing situations. A quiet word of public admonishments. Now, if an assessor hasn't heard it, let's do the other way around. Let's say, all of a sudden, the referee pulls out a red card, sends someone off. And he says, goes, what was that for? He said, oh, he, he called me a, called me knobhead. And I didn't him. Oh, words that affect us stronger. Is the assessor going to go, oh, I'm not going to give any credit for that because I didn't hear it? True. He's not easy. So this, this sort of type of assessing can be framed of what we, we call gotchas. There was a TV program at Noel Edmonds called yeah. Gotchas. Where they, they wound someone up and give them a gotcha. If you've got to give a gotcha to a referee, he's probably had a good game and he's going looking for something. But when they go for give gotchas in top ends, remember a while back we said about mad mass control application decision maker. If these gotchas are in those those big ends of the assessments, you're going to lose big marks. So whatever you do, look like you're doing it. If the assessor hasn't ha hasn't seen you do it, or has seen you do it and not do it with it enough, then you need to, to know how that affects the game as a general. If you're happy as a mass official that you've controlled that situation and you've had no more trouble from that person and none of the opponents are happy with how you dealt with it, job done as far as I'm concerned. I've, I've got I've got one when it comes to opponents, and I'm fairly certain it was to do with opponents that um, I, I, I have a feeling that it was a Premier League referee. I, I can't remember quite who said it, but I have a feeling it was a Premier League referee. And and I, so I heard this being said once, and it was it was something like along the lines of when it when a situation's escalated, you know, and and. One team's not happy and they want to see some sort of punishment or some sort of rebuke for the opposition about, about it. That there was one a referee just saying to him, Look, I'm just going to pretend I'm talking to you now. Um, you know, are we going to win for a pint after this game or whatever? And then they have that quick exchange and then it goes. And 
to all intents and purposes for everybody around who obviously wasn't involved in the conversation. It looks as if the referee's given him a, a telling, but actually the referee's just killed a bit of time, implicated the opponent and, and potentially a, an observer, although I don't I don't know if that was the, the, the intention of that particular story was to, to talk about observers, but I know that sometimes doing things like that to uh, placate one team who feel that a player's maybe crossed the line when in fact, you know, they've just done something that was maybe, an, I think it was actually to do with an accidental incident, you know, where they've, they've seen an accidental thing, you know, sometimes you can land awkwardly and a foot can land on somebody or, or whatever it might be. And, um, and then in the, in the opposition, they want blood. So as a referee, you go in and you say, well, look, I'm going to give you this little talking to and let's just pretend we're having a bit of an exchange about it. And you just say, oh, sorry, ref. And then we just crack on with it. And I think sometimes things like that can can really, um, you know, obviously I've talked about match control before, can really enhance your match control because people go, okay, but players will go, okay, well, he's a referee. He's, he's, he's actually seen fit to, to, to take our side, even though he's not really taking their side. And he deals with things, so then that buys you a little bit of time later on in the in the game. I think if, if you have a, a big incident. Yeah, I'm familiar with that story. I'm not sure, like you say, who the ref is, um, but I've used that myself. Like you say, there's an incident on the field. Everyone has this expectation of a card, but as the referee, yeah. maybe you don't feel like it was worthy of a card. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you want to, yeah, you, you want to take the player to one side and just just deliver the expectation that you are having a word with that player. Even though everyone's expecting you to give them a bollocking, you can say, listen, I see what's happened. In my opinion, it's just a coming together. Um, but for my match control, everyone's expecting, you're not obviously going to say these words to the player, but for my match control, everyone's expecting us to have a conversation at this point. Let's have a very obvious conversation. I, I retain some of my match control. You don't go away with a booking that I think you don't deserve. Uh, and the game carries on. Um but yeah, no, it's it's one of those ones, isn't it? Kind of managing the expectations of the players and to a certain extent, the crowd and, and the, the, the benches as well. Mm. Yeah, I've seen a lot about this recently where, um, because and it all harks back to me to a presentation I saw from Chris Kavanagh where he talked about delivering expectancy within games. And, and, and you know, it was, it, was other, it was other things, you know, it was things like everybody's expecting a goal kick now you've seen a touch, but you're going to give that goal kick because it's what everybody's expecting. And, and if you deliver what is expected um, within a game, um, then you, you know you're going to retain a much higher level of, of, of match control. And that's not just from the perspective of an observer; that's from the perspective yeah. of the, the club officials, the spectators, the players, the, everybody who's there. Um, and, and I saw I saw a presentation recently, actually really really good presentation um, on the referees association. Um, and what 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 they did is they they had uh, Ryan Atkin on, um, who was who is obviously well known as being an LGBTQ plus um, kind of referee and, and one who can really support that um, and, and and is a real role model for referees. But he talked in more general terms about his games and one of them, one of the concepts that he was promoting was safe refereeing. And, and, and again, that was one of the things he touched upon. So I think that in many, many ways, there are, there are a lot of opportunities that you have within games to, to look after yourself and to make sure that, that you do the right things for the game, but for yourself and your own credibility and, and, and your own uh, strength in terms of your authority in the game, because that's something that, that referees often talk about that I, I hear, you know, about stamping your authority on games and things like that. So I definitely think that doing things like that and looking after yourself in that way is really, really important. Yeah, some purists will say that's manipulating it. You know, you're not really, you're pretending to do something. I'm all for it. I've, I've yeah. gone as far as even coach players to say, yeah, refs to say, Say to the player, do us a favour. They think I'm giving you a bollock. Just tap my right shoulder with your left arm to thank me. And they're going to think I'll give you a really big bollock and they're going to run away happy. Yeah. So there's different escalations of how you can... And he's lying on the floor with a broken leg and he taps your shoulder. You know, there is situations to do it. 
And you need to be aware of that. Remember, we said a while back about our referee's toolbox. And as you grow through seven to six, yeah. you have this toolbox and you'll find, don't use them in every situation, but have them here as a tool to use whenever you feel you need it. Now, that goes right into body language, non-verbal communication, massive, massive part of, of managing any event, particularly when you're out in the middle on your own. And you've got to show people what you're doing with your non-verbal communication, which is so important. There's, if you hear someone, I remember um, on the line, ref come off, and uh, he says, oh, God, you know, that number eight's getting on my on my set. You know, he's, he's, he's on my back. He's, he, he's just constantly giving me, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do him. I'm going to do him on the set. I don't know what you're on about. Uh, I don't know what you're on about. It, it just looks like he's just talking to you. And that's a good example of it. Because you're there and you're smelling the blood, you're in it. And he's been, but if it doesn't look so bad, don't overreact. It's a, it be Try to be aware of your surroundings as a referee. When you're out there in the middle and you've got someone, other people might not see it. Other people might not hear it. That can work for you or against you. Whatever you do, don't overreact. Just don't overreact. Yeah. And the non-verbal communication is, 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 is just so important. We did it. I, I'm not sure if it was... If we do... We did do that about this, that signal. We did that one, didn't we? When I told you about what does that mean, yeah. we said, when you do that signal, for those who are listening on radio, it's where you put your two fingers around each other to say the ball's moving. But when you do that signal, that means three different things in football. You could even make four, mean four. It means the ball was moving, take the free kick again. It means hurry up, keep it. You know, you're taking too long or a player, and we've got a substitute. So you've got one signal that means three different things. So the non verbal communication level of things is really important. But you've got to get it right. When you talk about an open palm instead of a pointed finger, a player, something. There's loads of little subtleties, but in managing any violent found abusive language is another one. The finger to the mouth can have can be a bad thing in certain situations. But with the right player at the right time, a finger to your mouth and a very passive look, just shush him in it, really works. Yeah, that's one I use myself, the, the finger to the mouth thing. Uh it's Especially when when one player is having a go at me, my my tolerance, my skin is super thick. My tolerance is thick. No, my tolerance is high. My skin is thick. So before taking action that would that would lead to a card coming out, I will kind of allow them to vent to to a certain extent. If they cross a certain line, like if they become offensive at me, at my person, or something like that, then we go yeah straight for the book. But if they're just having a moan about not getting a free kick like they they expected. And they just come, they're just venting at me. A finger on the lip shows, I'm not listening, crack on. Um, and I find that that, um, that the, the, the finger on the lip, whilst provocative, if used incorrectly, um, I think in, in the, the most, most cases I've used it is, is, is worked. But then again, I wouldn't recommend a new ref or um, a ref that didn't have my level of confidence, tolerance, or thick skin to, to, to kind of adopt that sort of match control or control of individuals. Yeah, yeah I agree, mate, because we can go far back as some, some non-verbal communication is, is sort of ebbs and flows. Some of them become trendy. Remember, everyone used to do the lobster, didn't they? You know, the two-handed, he's yapping at me, you know, and then that was frowned upon and then it wasn't. Then there's the one lo the one lobster where you, you you can warn someone. I think my team did it quite a lot. Where When he called a, a, a player over to him and the captain would say something, he'd, he'd do the lobster to say, it's all right, I'm just having a word. I don't yeah. need you. I don't need you. So but that's a skill set. That needs to be in your toolbox, absolutely. But as you say, and as you come through your career or your hobby, whatever way you want to frame what you're doing in the frame, these tools can, can be really useful. It's about being aware of, of, of how to address something and the options you've got. It isn't just one form way suit all. Yeah. If you are a, a ref that's never tried it before, I'd say give it a go. Maybe not in a high pressure, high stakes match, but try it out. If it goes tits up, well, you've tried it once and you'll never use it again, but you'll find that maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, but don't be afraid to, to use the tools that are available to you for your match control. Because I think a lot of a lot of young referees or very inexperienced referees are genuinely worried about saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, uh, looking a certain way, uh, especially if there are 
mentors, assessors, observers about, maybe not mentors so much, but definitely assessors and, and observers. Um, you know, you, you need to develop your own personality and style and allow that to come out in your refereeing. And to do that, you do have to tread unfamiliar ground. Uh, and I'd just say, don't be afraid to do that. I think that, I think, you, I think you're quite right, Ant, uh, in terms of trying things out and having that openness, because I think ultimately, if you look at, if you look at it like a car, okay, I could drive a BMW, you could drive a Mercedes, Martin could, could, could drive a VW, okay? Now, we could all be driving manual cars, so we've all got, you know, clutch, brake, accelerator, we've got a gear, gear stick, but, you know, you might have a 10-inch multimedia screen, I might have a 5-inch, Martin might have an 8-inch, okay? So we're all working from the same <laughs> fundamental. <laughs> Sorry, Martin's reaction on that is like, ah, upgrade. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've, been many, I've been called mayonnaise whenever it's in. <laughs> I didn't call you that. <laughs> but, yeah. You know, we're all, we're all, <laughs> let's be back to refereeing, man. We're all, um, we're all, we're all working from the same sort of mechanical layout. So we could all drive each car, but we've all got slightly different features within the, within the car and you get slightly different features. And I think that it's what you bolt onto those mechanics as a referee yeah. that, that defines you as a referee and, and makes up your referee and style. So I think that there's a, a number of tools and a number of a number of different sized multimedia screens you can choose from to put on your car, but ultimately it's how you choose to 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 sort of use the, the tools because you, you you know no referee is going to have every single tool and is, is going to use every single tool in the book. It's about finding the ones that work for your style, for your manner, for your presence, for everything that yeah. goes with you. And I think that that's one of the big things. And once you once you're comfortable with yourself as a referee, and once you know what you're good at and what you're not so good at and what, where your strengths lie and where they don't and what you can do and what you can't do. I think that, you know, you're, you're in a really good moment to sort of then find the trajectory to start climbing the levels because, because you've got that little bit of confidence, which we talk about being such a key asset for referees, uh, because you, you know your own ability and you know your own style and, and you know your own way inside out, which I always think is a crucial, crucial part of being a referee. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is, and it's it's like um, it's like many situations. And you know, sometimes you get you get you get criticised for overdoing things and underdoing things. And it's having that right balance of as, as ever, everything you're doing. I remember the um, the PGMOL um, psychologist. What's his name? Nate Simon? Is it Simon? Oh, it's Simon Brave. That, no, no, he's he's the he's the fitness lad. Was it not Liam? Uh, Liam Slack. Liam Slack. Yeah. Liam Slack. He did a presentation once with one of the referees academy, and he, he described how referees are on an island, but like on an island on our tod, but in within an ocean, whatever was going on around us. And I always thought that was like a a, a good way of describing a referee. But you know, even when we're in a team of three, but on our own, on that on that pitch on that other island, which is called the, the field of play. And I think you know, once we have this tender character to be able to a believe in ourselves and have confidence that what we're doing is right, don't let someone put doubt in your minds. I think all, all of it just comes in. And any referees out there that are starting out and they might be listening to some of the stuff we talk about, if you're not if you're not comfortable with it, don't don't use these things, and don't feel yeah. like you're any less of a referee because you're not using them. Everything will come, and you'll develop your own ways of doing all, all the things that we've just talked about. Segue into uh, I I want to take this opportunity to say. Um, Recently, and I'm, I don't know why it's been highlighted recently because she's been phenomenal all season. But Sean Massey, oh. what a master official actually is! She's a what machine. A she's an absolute like uh, you, Martin. You put on the ref support um, <laughs> Twitter last night. I think it was. If you rearrange the letters that spell out Sean Massey, it you can make up the the phrase. We don't need VAR anymore. She's that good. She's that that reliable with with our sides and uh, her reading of the game, her uh, interpretation and application of laws. It's absolutely phenomenal. And it's it seems to be just recently. I mean, I want to say since the restart of the you know project restart in the Premier League, I've seen her trending on Twitter twice. 
and for the right reason, in that everyone's going, mm. fucking hell, where, you know, she's been on the Premier League for a long time, but only very recently is getting this sort of acknowledgement of how good she is. And I think, fair fucking play to her. Like, she's been consistently doing it for a while, but the 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 mainstream, the, especially on Twitter, where, where a lot of things can be a bit, I'll say toxic and negative, to see someone praised universally for doing a great job as a match official. If if this somehow gets to her, that message, I think that from the three of us, no one can disagree with what I'm saying on this. It's, it's, it's just been brilliant and consistently brilliant for, for not just this season, but the, the past few seasons. I think Chris Kamara came on, didn't he? He went, here, here. Because I, I said, you know, I don't even know why. Why wasn't this girl chosen to go? The FIFA men's route. I know we were having a bit of a WhatsApp exchange, maybe Nathan, yeah. about yeah. like you know they have this FIFA. You know, when when you're FIFA, when you look on the website, it just says male, female. Mm. It doesn't tell you what route you come through. And I just can't quite get my head around that she's done the Champions League final, women's final. Yeah. She's done the women's FA Cup final. I think she was fourth division on the line. Yeah. But she's never done anything like that in the men's game. Mm-hmm. But, so when when. This is, this is where it sits with me, and it always has. It's why I was so, you know, praiseworthy of it, because she's just top, top draw. I think it's on about 800 likes, and if people are jumping on it and saying, yeah. oh, my God. You know, one lad said, I ain't seen her at, at the Arsenal, because I know she's going to get everything right. She's going to get away with anything. You know, that was a, what an ultimate compliment. compliment that yeah. But when you have a merit list, like you do in the Premier League, and don't forget the Premier League, the PGMOL don't choose fee for officials. That's down to the referees committee and, and my good friend, David Zellery. They choose it. Now, when they have when they have a, um, a merit list, are you telling me Sean Massey hasn't been near the top of that merit list to be nominated for men's FIFA? I would stick my house on it. Mm. That's all, over the period of time, whatever time, how many years she's been on, she's finished above men who's gone the men's route, and she's on the women's game. And I just can't quite square that off. I just don't understand why do does European football and world football want the best officials? Yes. Is it absolutely irrelevant whether that is a man or a woman? It's irrelevant. You just put the best one on. Yeah. And I think UEFA, FIFA, and the FA, I praised David Ellery last time tonight. He what a wonderful decision it was with him, with, with the FA Cup. Great, fair play, pat on the back. But something's not right here. Something's not right here. That girl should be doing the top flight games in men's football in Europe. I'm not undervaluing the women's game at all. Brilliant, you know, get best officials there. They deserve good officials too. But let's have one merit list and let's stick someone like Sean Massey on, you know, top, top games in the UEFA Champions League and, and in, in the World Cups. She's been to a women's World Cup as well, but not to the men's. I just can't quite get my head around when they had that decision to say, right, who's going to be on FIFA today? This year's FIFA, did you do it at Christmas? Yes, yes, yes. Where was it? Oh, yes, Sean's third, but we're not going to put her on the men's game because she's a woman. Where would you get away with that? And what level of... And then you have Bibi and the Steinhaus absolutely pulling up trees on, on, mm. the, on the Bundesliga. Bundesliga. One of the best referees. <laughs> You've got women doing top-class men's game now and again, popping in, popping out. No, let's get them in there all the time. Don't let it be unusual to have a woman doing Champions League games in the middle and on the line. End of story. I mean, I, I think that, um, that, that when you look at uh, when you look at her in particular, Sean Massey, I mean, I agree, firstly, I just want to say I agree with a lot of what you said there, Martin. Um, you know, I think that Ke- it was Kevin Friend. Kevin Friend did the, the cup final last year, didn't he? Yes. And, and so, so if you look at Kevin Friend and you look at, at Sean Massey, they both came onto the list around the same time for the Premier League, about 10 years. And I think that what you're seeing now is them both, like a fine wine, really starting to mature really well and really come into the peak. And, and I think that Sean is in a team more often than not with Daniel Cook and Chris Kavanagh. And that's who she did our first men's European game in the Europa League. I think it was in it was in Austria, I think it was Salzburg, Europa League earlier this season. This season and that's very, very recently been doing that, mate. Yeah. Yeah. And so and I and I think that 
Sorry, sorry, Martin. How long have you been on the FIFA list? Uh, so, well, ten years for, since women's. Once you got nominated onto the FIFA list, yeah. When you, when you look at the FIFA list, let me have a look at it because we put, I didn't put a thing on, on last night. Yeah, there was a, a picture and next to it on the FIFA.com, it says what year she comes on, doesn't it? Yeah. So he, was it, I think it was 2009, wasn't it? So let me just have a look, mate. Just two seconds. Uh, let me get it up. Let me get it up. Let me get it up. Sean Massey, 2009. Yeah. So as, as, you're right, just over 10 years, mm -hmm. he's been on that list. Let's, yeah. Let's give, let's give a better benefit out to those who choose. Yeah. So you've got, it's got to be some of the best um, assistant referee for, for at least five years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the top performance. So yeah. five years they've had to get into the men's game regularly. I think that um, that what what I what I think about the way that the, the positions uh, Sean is, I think that the, she 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 started um, she started her career. Um, I think she did a few games with Howard Webb and people like that, and I think that um, she's been she's been excellent for them in, in right at the beginning of her career. And now she comes and works with Daniel Cook and Chris Kavanagh, who have only really been on in the last three or four years on the Premier League. And so she's bringing an awful lot of experience working with a lot of guys, probably, probably I'm guessing now, but I'm, 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 I would say the likes of Chris Foy and people like that who are not actually on the list anymore. But she had the experience of running the line to some very, very experienced referees um, in her early career as an assistant in the, in the Premier League. Um, and now she's the, the the sort of most experienced member of the team when she works with with her regular team, and she brings a lot of that experience. And as I say, she's maturing because of what she's learned, not just from Chris and from from Daniel, but from probably people like Darren Khan and obviously Andy Garrett, who's just retiring. And you know, there was a lot of really long serving assistants before that, the likes of Mike Malarkey and people like that, who, I'm pre who I presume she worked with because if she worked with Howard Webb, she must have worked with some of these other guys as well. Coach for the PGM are well persistent, isn't he? Top, top yeah. world-class choice. Now, yeah. Dan Cook only got, got on the FIFA list in 2019. So she's got 10 years more FIFA experience than him. Yeah. So I think it's, I think that he's, he learns from here. He, they will learn yeah. from here. It's just that I just think... That you know, this is what the pro this is what I think is that it's it's a it's almost an unanswered question. So that was the tweet was that's got so much traction. Why is she not a regular men's UEFA and FIFA official? Why is she? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, "Oh, isn't it wonderful? Sean's done a first game at PSV Eindhoven or in some Europa League." No, no, we should be moaning because she hasn't got one. Yeah, she's a world class. Yeah. Off-board official that we delivered from this country, another one, another one that, in my opinion, isn't getting used to the full yeah. potential on the world's game, men's game. Again, I'm not slagging off women's football because I don't think it's amazing. I think where that's going is just yeah. brilliant. But at the moment, and before women's football has got to where it was, now it was nowhere near the right level for a Premier League test assistant to be doing those games. Let's just be brutally honest about it. It's developed over the last say, yeah. three or four years, rightly so. Those years, I feel, have been wasted. She should be given her skills at the top end of the Champions League and Europa League game. Mm -hmm. No question about it. And I don't know why anyone has never really flashed that up and said, why aren't we using Sean in our top level UEFA and Champions League and FIFA games? Here's a question for you then, Martin. If she was working, because obviously we know that Michael Oliver's got his team and they work regularly together domestically and internationally, and the same for, for Anthony Taylor. But if, if 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 she was in one of their teams, would that have come? Would that have come sooner? Because I I look at it and I think that potentially that she might need to move teams in order to be able to access these because because Anthony and Michael are elite. They're elite within the FIFA categories, and I think for her, you know, Chris um, has time to develop. You know, he's very young, as we said. And he can become elite, uh, but obviously that takes time. And, and by the time that happens, you know, Sean might be a, a bit further down the line in, in terms of her career and thinking thinking more towards the end of her career, whereas now we've got her at our peak. 
should we move it? Should we move teams? You know, should we put her in in a, in a team where she can work with an elite, or she can work with at least a, a sort of I, I don't recall what the second category is called within uh, FIFA list. But even if she can work at a level where she can do some games uh, within the Champions League, because I, I, I'm not sort of seeking to defend anybody here, but I do think that genuinely the reason why she's not done as many international games and not done as many uh, UEFA competition, particularly Champions League competition, is because, you know, I think, I know we talked about her doing our first game, but I think it's one of Chris's first games as well. I don't think he's done more than three or four uh, in, in, in competition. So I think that... She's probably being put with Chris. Yeah. I would say she's being put with Chris. As a, as a positive, because she's so greatly experienced, yeah. she probably needs it. Oh, yeah. Because she'll know everyone at the grounds, all the people who you meet at the grounds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just about what's on, on, on the field with her, which she always excels, always has. Yeah. And any of the grief she, she's had has been from, from other people in the media. As, mm -hmm. as, yeah. Nothing on the game, nothing off the game, no scandal. Her husband's is, is also a good referee coming to the yeah. ranks. Now, I don't think we should judge our assistant referees on who they referee with. I don't think, I think it's absolutely irrelevant whether you're doing it with a, an elite referee or someone like, like Cal who's just coming through. I just mm -hmm. think, look at the talents and give it the games. I'm all for having teams and and because that creates consistency, trust, confidence, yeah. you know, you, and, and they have a good feeling about you like as a ref you would have about them. But I think she's proved their point. She proved mm -hmm. their point years ago and she yeah. should have done the FA Cup by now. She should have. You remember, you probably won't have money but short of if you were alive when this happened, Lance, but um, Wendy Tom's referees, I think it was called the Milk Cup final once. And it's the Carabao Cup now. Well, Carabao Cup or whatever it was called yeah. now. It's been Milk Cup and Rumble O's Cup and God knows what. Coca-Cola Cup, Cup at one point. Coca-Cola Cup. Yeah. Oh, There's a good question for you. <laughs> well, you know, Wendy Tom's, another world's class, absolute world class, uh, female mass official. Well, just mass official. They ignore female, just a world class mass official. I think, I think it was Alan Wilkie, I think it was, who was on that game, he refereed the game where Cantona jumped into the crowd, uh, him, yeah. which funny enough, he called his book, didn't he, One Night at the Palace? Because that, that, when Cantona because jumped into the crowd, it, it was because uh, the buzz thing. Yeah. Like, Alan's another one from my area, Martin. Alan's another one from, from the North East. Yeah. yeah, he does, I think he does all the uh, uh, moderating for the observers, doesn't he? Um, yeah, so going back, he got, he got injured in the, in, the, in the Milk Cup final and there was a dilemma there because I think she was, the, she was the senior official. I think she was Panel then, for those who don't know what panel was, it's the conference, I keep on a conference, National League Premier Standard Referee. And she didn't go on. It was a bit of a, again, anyone out there listening, please write in, go, go to Anthony, not me, I'm too busy. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I don't know, I know, we're all busy. Write in and tell us if we're right, but I'm pretty sure at the time, Alan Wilkie go down injured, I think it was a car. Um, she was on the line, she was a senior official, but she didn't go in the middle. I think the hierarchy come down from the... Uh, the soft seats in Wembley, and uh, and I had a discussion, and she didn't go in the middle. I think maybe we should look at that before our next vlog. Yeah, you know, that's, getting, that's getting, worth having a little little dig. It is. Have a look at that because I, I, I'm the point I'm making is we've had world class, class uh, female match officials for ages. Janie yeah. Frampton, who's the chair of Ref Support UK, she, I think she was the second one to get to that level of football. Soft, soft draw match officials. So we just don't know why. If and and football stakeholders. Teams, players, managers, they should be shouting this as well. So relevant if you're a woman or not, just have the best officials on the best games. End of story. I totally agree. Now that that point has been made, um, I'll, I'll keep this as a separate segment, but halfway through that, Martin's microphone fell off. Now, Nobody if, noticed that. Nobody if you, yeah, yeah, but if you're watching this, you'll you'll have seen it and we had a little giggle. But if you're listening to this on the podcast, you'll be like, what are they laughing about? They're laughing about Sean Massey? Absolutely not. We're like three immature school kids and Martin had a little technical difficulty. I and we all... And then I got a phone call. Uh, and you did. <laughs> I've, I've got a, an iPhone and a bloody Mac Air thingy and the, and the line's up. So I thought I was being professional, put the phone on silence, not realizing that's where you go to my laptop, isn't it? Or whatever these MacBook things are called. Yeah. But like, it's, yeah, so sorry about that. Sorry about that. Nah, nah, nah. We, we, yeah, we all had a little giggle there. But it was it was at that. Martin. It was at Martin. And not at, at Sean. And not at Sean. We we're all very, very big fans of. We are. And, and but rightly so. And it's 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 good to to you know, praise where it's due. 
fair play to her. Um, what was the other thing? There was a third kind of hot topic that we were going to talk about. We're going to talk about the, the, the COVID advice that we've been waiting oh, for. Oh, yeah, shit, that was really it. COVID was the same as the other stuff. Yeah. So um, if, if you want, because we get a few international viewers and listeners of this as well, uh, some of whom will have already gone back to grassroots football. Others aren't expecting to go back to October, November time. But here in the UK, it's friendly matches at grassroots are due to start from the 1st of August, which is in two days' time at the, at the point that we're recording this. As of yet, as a referee, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. There's been nothing coming my way with regards to um, pre-match, during the match, post-match, uh, correspondence. I've had nothing. Gentlemen, have you heard anything? Well, I think, I think Mr Cassidy's heard, heard a lot of things. <laughs> We we um, we got sent the documents, FA documents that we put on a web link on our website, uh, refsupport.co.uk, and we put up there the, the guidance for it. Put a link out. Uh, we just thought, you know, yeah, we'll help everyone because someone at the FA said, "Oh, it'll only be sent to registered referees," which is a bit absolutely bizarre because some referees who want to continue the season might not have registered for whatever reason. Essential workers might not be able to afford it. Whatever should be sent to everyone. Wound me up a little bit. So when I got in, I, I put it on our um, on our website. I put the link out. Now um, it's put on Facebook. Caused a bit of commotion in some county FAs because we've put it out on social media before the FA have, before county FAs have, before the RA have, which, in my opinion, it says more about them than me. But if I'm really, really honest, well, like there is things like in here that says you know, your pre-match should be outdoors. Your pre-match, go outdoors. That's well, that's something. That, that sounds great, doesn't it? You know, you know, unless it's absolutely tipping us down. Don't yeah, do British you summertime. Yeah, ma- arriving in mask kit, great. You can all change the rooms down open, so go on the sofa and wet. Great, <laughs> thanks for that. There's no, like, there's no, it's close. And and, and let's be honest, there's, listen, I know we're taking a mick of it here, but let's be really honest. The FA are in a difficult position, aren't they? Oh, of course. There's a, there's a couple that have been furloughed, but not the people that deal with this in the referees' departments. I think it's um, Alan K- Chris Kay and uh, Adam Kenton, who does the appointments, I think they've been furloughed and hopefully they get jobs back because they're two good people. The people who deal with this haven't been furloughed. And, and remember, the FA is one organisation. They are not they are split in, de- in departments, you know, for obviously productivity, etc. So when that, these someone speaks in the FA, they speak for all stakeholders. They don't say, all right, we're only going to speak for players and clubs and we'll talk about referees later as an organisation. You talk about all stakeholders. When they released that information, what, 10 days ago, maybe longer? 10 days ago, saying, here's the COVID advice for stakeholders. Nothing, nothing specific for referees. Absolutely nothing. The referees department come in, who sometimes look like they're on an organisation on their own, and said, oh, yeah, we'll release it in due course. So they put a holding statement up. We started flashing up. Hang on, it's been, a, it's been a week now. What's going on? Oh, another holding statement come up. And then the RA joined in with another holding statement saying, oh, yeah, we support the FA's holding statement by making a holding statement there. Good stuff. Nothing. Nothing. There's, and even when it's come out now, it isn't, it is specific to referees and fair play to them, it's a difficult document. But a lot of that could have been posted as referees with, with, when the other stuff got, 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 got um, posted and released. I don't understand even what's in it now, specific referee stuff. You know, that could have been released weeks ago. Why did we make referees wait to the day after tomorrow? They're taking games now, appointments for friendlies, pre-season games. The day after tomorrow, straight away, you can look at loads of questions there. I put a tweet out saying if, if they release this information at five o'clock on a Friday, like Trump does, like Boris does, yeah. so no one can get back and answer to them. I will ask for them to resign at the top of the referees department because that would be disgraceful. Two hours after it, we got all of this document. So read into that, whatever you want. However, in this document, there isn't things like when you've got club assistant referees and they've got the flag, and every, everyone who's listening to this or watching this, how many times a game has the referee changed the line on because the sub's doing it or something like that, and they come on and have we got to sterilise the, 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 the flag every time? Have we got to wear gloves for the, the subs who are doing the line? You know, have we got to wash the ball? Have we got to make sure they do everything? And, you know, and then the conclusion of the documents at the end of it says, um, it was in big, bold letters. Let me just flash it up, guys. And it says something on the lines is, don't do anything about it. It's just reported to the FA. Something... Referees are not responsible for any breaches of COVID guidelines 
on match on match day. It says well, it must report as, be reported to the FA by the referee in the post match MOAS report. Now, the, the friendly's on MOAS. I mean, known. yeah, no, it, not, at a I certain no, I'm not. They're just not, they're not. And then also, which was if I was a, if, just imagine if I was a referee and I'm stuck in that position, you've got clubs struggling absolutely on the bones of their ass, and you're going to say to a referee, report them because he didn't have much the ball. They didn't have this. Did really, really throw that on the referee's lap. Yeah, thanks for that, mate. Yeah, that's cool. With two days before the game, that's the sort of thing I'm miffed with. But we've got all the sympathy in the world for the guys at the FA referees departments for the difficult decision for the whole football game and everyone, Joe Pope, like essential workers, terrible, terrible, terrible. But don't tell me this couldn't have been released a week ago so we could then clarify things like we've just mentioned. No, absolutely. The, the FA is a national body, right? It's a national response. There's the, the guidelines are not going to be different in Merseyside than they are in Devon or in Newcastle or wherever. The, the guidelines for all grassroots football in England are going to be the same. So, yeah, it sh what I've been told and what a lot of referees have been told are, is your RDO or your local county FA will be in touch with the guidelines. And why is it down to them? Like like I said, what, okay. what specifically can they say or do that would be different to what the FA would do? Um, the FA's got all of our details, all of our emails, our, you know, our fan numbers or whatever, and they could just you know, blanket email, here it is, um, and, and two days, two days before the restart of grassroots football is what is, like you said, it, it doesn't leave it open for scrutiny. It doesn't leave it open for the for the what ifs. What if this happens? What do I do? Um, and it is almost like they've they've very belatedly come out with this guidelines. Okay, yeah, it's going to be picked apart by everyone, all the stakeholders in the game. But they pushed it onto the RDOs and said, you know what? If anything comes back from anyone, that's your problem now. Uh, the the FA have come up with these these guidelines. Uh, but but they're not the ones that are going to be dealing with the questions that come back. That's going to be go, done down on a, a more local level. Referees should wear um, a face mask upon reliable at the ground and at all times until they start their warm-up. The, the so way, we, we as referees could get um, reported as well. If we don't follow this, we could get, you know, dubbed in by the clubs. And yeah. It says here, referees should, should clean assist and referee flags before... And after use, so not during the game if you swap it, then not really. Are you, are you sure about that? If they change the system of referees, you tell me they wouldn't have thought about that. That's probably a difficult one to answer. That's why it's not in there. But yeah. again, we've we got to under, we got to be sympathetic towards them. But there's a few things that that we could go through here that it isn't the fact that they might have got it wrong or it could have been a bit more informative. It's the fact that they haven't given referees time to question it that's the point I, I, as far as i'm aware they still haven't released it publicly it's, it's only out because we released it we've released it yeah and it's just not right it's just not it's just not not good enough it just isn't good enough it just we, i'm sick and tired absolutely sick and tired if the referees come in last in football first to blame last to think of organize all the friendlies by the way let's get everything sorted out of course i've done a ref yet Come on, there's football clubs out there that were brilliant and look after referees. Yeah. And we'd, we would expect the old club not to think of a referee, but or to think of a referee last. But not our governing body, not the referees departments, not the FA to think, oh, oh, the last thing we're going to think of, well, let, oh, let's sort out some specific advice for uh, for referees. Should have all come out at the same time. We're all one team. Yeah. Simbins. Simbins is in there. There's no change to Simbins. Okay. Okay, I think I, th I think that that, that you know we, I agree with you about questioning some things and then and I, th I think that it's a common sense approach that if you question some things you can then say okay well we'll actually add that because that's a really good point that's coming through you know we, we we maybe like we say obviously it's very difficult not to do this before not to play grassroots football with the with this stress before. Um, it's a totally new thing, so okay, we need to accept that. 
that there's going to be some challenges um, and, and there's going to be things that we don't think of because you only realise them by doing and, and, and you know, you can feed back. This is a problem that we, we, we're experiencing so we can change the guidelines to to kind of factor that in. But, but I think that the one, the way I look at it, and obviously, you know, you, you guys understand this from, from my point of view and my concern is there'll be an awful lot of match officials out there. You know, there's... Uh, I believe I'm t- I believe that there's 20 there was 28,000 um, registered match officials at the end of last season um, and a good good number of them will be involved with obviously living with people who have had to shield throughout this process who are at extra risk They'll, some of them will have maybe some things that they're a little bit unsure about themselves that they've always been a little bit cautious throughout this time because they, they may have had asthma when they were younger but not recently but still maybe think oh I might be a little bit more vulnerable and, and I think that what I think about and certainly like I said it, it, my concern is there'll be a lot of referees who are quite anxious about going back to football but uh, but obviously love it and obviously want to get back involved and obviously want to want to get fit and ready you know for the season to begin so that they can be um, an active participant within the season because pre-season is just as important for referees as it is for players and everybody else um, we need to get games, particularly after after what we've just gone through. You know, not refereeing game. I think my last game was the 9th of March. So, you know, not refereeing for that period of time. It's absolutely true that we need to we need to get back in the feel of it, um, and and obviously to to appreciate as we we'll have to do every summer, which is difficult as it is, appreciating law changes that have come in and getting used to operating with with law changes. Just 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 so many things that that, that happen that that we need to be a part of and we need to understand. But but what I what I care about and what I worry for is that the number of referees who have got a lot of anxiety about yeah. this. You know, there'll be a lot of referees who are quite blasé and quite, you know, fit, healthy guys, never really had many health problems and they're looking forward to getting back. And, that, and that's great and that's fine and that's wonderful. But there will be some referees who, you know, like I said, have got some things that go on around them or within themselves and there'll be a, a real nervousness um, and, I, and I do think that you know I think that I think the, the guidance that the FA released in February about mental health and things like that means that in my opinion the FA are on the ball with it you know um, and there's particular people who are referenced in that document who you know RDOs I'm talking about here who I know that if I lived in those counties uh, that they'd be spot on with me because I know that they've experienced things like that themselves and, and they and they totally, totally understand it and they've been absolutely wonderful. And, I, and through through my job with a third team, I've worked with some really wonderful RDOs who care passionately about mental health and the well-being of their referees and have had to deal with some incredibly difficult stuff, by the way, from their referees, things that go way beyond football, the, the things that are they're involved in life and death ultimately. So I, I think that we, we, we know the importance of RDOs and, and things like that. So I, I, I think that m- more than anything, this delay, unfortunately, what, you know, I know that they want to get it right and they want it to be perfect, but clearly that document has been produced for a short period of time now so that, that it could have been maybe released a little bit earlier. And I just think it's really, really important that, you know, that we can answer the questions for those who've got worries about the health and, and other real concerns that have been bugging them, to be quite honest with you, ever since the announcement that the friendlies could commence from the 1st of August was made. Yeah, good point, mate. And I think it does cause anxiety. We've had loads of people on. We had lots of private messages um, saying, look, I'm a bit worried about, you know, turning up, dressed for, dress for the game, you know, and then going on wet and, you know, all those sorts of things. The thing that we must remember the stakeholders of football, all the football and family, is that one man's problem might be another man's choke. That doesn't make it any less. You know, some people have genuine concerns that people might laugh at. You can go back to swearing. You can you can you can do a currency exchange on swearing. Some accountants will say never never heard a swear word in their life. Bricklayers will hear it every every comma. With this one, some people can be genuine anxious about not being informed. People will worry about that. That will keep them. Up at night because they want to do a professional job. They don't want to break any form of guidelines, be it FA yeah. guidelines, COVID, government guidelines. It's a genuine concern. And yeah, we've got massive sympathy for those in the referees departments. Absolutely 100 percent in, in the situation they must be in now. But their own mental health, because they 
they're the ones issuing the themselves. They're, they're, their name's going to stick to it. But yeah. I just think, I'm not sure it's good enough to have it out. You know, here we are now on the 30th of July and games are starting on the 1st of August. Yeah. That's just not, I'm just sorry, that's just not good enough. Yeah. Too late. Think so? Too late. It's it's sad, and it's sad, and I'm, you know, people say it's, you know, we can probably do the same with the Hackasaurus and, and them lot, where we did always slagging off the PGMOL or whatever. I don't want to do that. That's why we like to balance this. We said about David Ellie was great with the Anthony Taylor stuff, and there's some wonderful, wonderful stuff that the FA does, absolutely 100%. But personally, I'm getting sick and tired of referees being the last ones to think of in football, and I never expected it to come from the referees' department of our governing body at Wembley Stadium. Yeah. There's there's literally nothing else. It just does feel like a big letdown. Mm. Uh, we, we, I've, I've said before, we love the game as much as any player, as much as any fan, as much as anyone, any stakeholder in the game. But it does feel that we to a certain extent, aren't loved back. And that's, it's just, it just sucks sometimes. Um, we, we, you know, the expectation is you're a referee. You're not there to be liked. You're there to do a job. Fine. Cool. We know that. We accept that. But it's almost as if that, that base level of support is just kind of, it's not even eroded away. It's just someone's gone, where, where is it? Where is it? Or if you do ask, you, you, you get the impression that I'll very dare you. Yeah. I'll very dare you ask me that question. Yeah. I'd be right to ask the question. You might ask me, but I'll very dare you ask me. I need to take a little bit with, with Nathan's points. There is some amazing RDOs out there. I, can't, I cannot agree yeah. with you more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From top, 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 I talk to them. Some of them, you know, don't want other people to know that they talk to us. You know, which, which again, we're happy with that. We're absolutely happy with that. As long as we help, we don't care who gets the credit or anything. But there's some RDOs out there that all we seem to think about is themselves and their career. And they won't put their head above the parapet for anybody. Yeah. Any referees, any, any, anything. That's, you know, that's their choice. But don't put it, throw the victim card in when we come at you. When we've had people saying, you haven't contacted us through this. You haven't, you haven't, you know, why did I hear from Ref Support UK about the government guidelines? And we release it on Thursday. When you got told on Monday in an RDO meeting, the FA had this meeting. They all said, oh, we've got a big meeting, a big Zoom meeting, whatever it is. We're all going to talk about it on Monday and release it. Why did we release it? Why did we think it was okay? And at this moment, here we are at 10 past three on Thursday afternoon, and there's county FAs. I've just looked on Twitter, haven't released it. Haven't done it. So might be fellows, whatever. But if this is if this is important enough, and referees are important enough, that would have been released by every single county FA. A bit like the days when he defended the FA and the vote on no confidence. Big cohesive approach to that, but that hasn't been to this. And as you can see, I'm, I'm really pissed off about it. I really I'd be it. interested to see their side of the story, though, Martin. I must say that there must be some reason why they have maybe some no com not no confidence, why but they, they have some questions think? about why why the, what why about the reason? Why do you think there'd be a reason? What what what? To me, to me, this this is what I believe it. Shoot me down, shoot me down if you want. It's a power struggle that happens all the bleeding time. It happens with why is the FA referees department always seem to look like the two things on their own? They're always doing things on their own. Even right back to how the Premier League's been created, the PGMOL. If you look at the FIFA Articles Association of FIFA, we should not have a PGMOL. It's technically against the Articles of Association of FIFA. We shouldn't have it. The national governing body, the FA, should run all our top game, all our top competition. That's so. Please don't ever expect normality, as far as I'm concerned. From some of the people that are referee easy departments of the FA, like we go, I go back to, you know, FIFA, choosing FIFA. We talked about that earlier. They choose the FIFA officials from a competition that they don't want. Well, look, what your view is on the PGMOL is uh, is your view, and and. <laughs> I've got no problem with the PGO and well. Mike Valley is a top top draw lad. Probably Keith Hackett is probably putting his ear out now. He's listening to this. He was he's ten times what Hackett was. His team's quality, Mike Valley, no problem with the boys there. Absolutely not. And the ladies, no problems at all. 
I just think there's a connection between the FA yeah. and well, how they do things just seems this. Remember right now, our first post, and I'm not having a go with you, mate. I'm just having sort of the other side of the story. No, no, I, I totally get that. Farm, about the animal farm thing. Yeah, yeah. The animal farm. They just always remember what animal farm. Anyone out there who wants to know what goes on in football, really wants a good look at the referee emails, read George Orwell's Animal Farm and see me and see if you recognise any characters in Animal Farm that you can put a picture in in the referee emails. Thank you very much. Okay, man. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Sorry, I've been I've moaned a lot today. I mean, I just apologise to everyone. I just think that I think that. I think there will be a legitimate reason, though, what what it what it is. But I, I think that where I will obviously agree with you quite rightly is that there's a lot of people who will be very anxious, and I think that for the sake of them, it should have probably come a little bit sooner. And I, I do, but I don't know what their what their their lookout is. And I, I, but I, I but I do think that you know, again, I know some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, at the FA, uh, as I'm sure you do as well, Martin, that that will f- maybe be uh, maybe have been fielding these questions from referees that they know and and wanting to give guidance, but obviously felt unable to because they were waiting for the official document. And I think that that for those people, you know, if it comes across the way that you've obviously described, where they feel like they're jettisoned from. From the from the main body of the FA, then I think that that's not not at all good for them. No, it's, it's not. I, I, that's how I generally feel. I've heard people say it. I've heard RDOs say it. You know, we, we the FA just don't listen to us. They just don't, they, they say they listen to them. They say all this. They say all that. There was you know the people come on our page and say we're having this big meeting with, with the FA. Big meeting. It's always a big meeting. It's never a meeting. It's always a big meeting. And they're having all the RTOs there, all talking. We will feed it all back to referees, and there we are Thursday, and they haven't done it. They haven't done it. It's, it's this sort of as if someone's scared. It's it, in my opinion, my opinion, not the charity's opinion. My opinion, Matt Cassie's opinion, is that too many people are scared of consequences that might come back from the FA. That's what I, I genuinely feel. I feel I've heard Clattenburg say it. I've heard other referees say it. That this sort of like. Do as you're told when we tell you to do it. Exists too much in the referee world. And that needs to change. So these good people who you know, Nate, and I know, Nate, and you know, and these RDOs and, and loads of others, are they need to have a stronger voice than the ones who are trying to shut them up. And when that changes, all football will win. There's some wonderful county FAs out there, wonderful strong county FAs. And I just wish they would stand up a bit more to those at P.O. Box 1966 and give them a bit of a shake down. You've got to look at the way it's it's kind of... On a, on a business level, if we look at it like this, you've got all these 28,500 referees registered in England, all self-employed. Now, if you were self-employed, uh, you contracted yourself out as a plumber um, and you had... Um, really bad experience with the people that had hired you, you wouldn't want to work with those people again in the sense that you required information for the job uh, so that you could properly disseminate it, you know, out amongst your colleagues and, and you could really drill down into what it all means enable, you know, for you to do your job. If that didn't come two days before the job you were meant to do and it needed more time than two days, you know, for a lot of people, it's not even come out yet. So if you're waiting in a certain area where you still don't have that document, it could be less than 24 hours, you know, if it comes out tomorrow for certain areas, for, you know, whatever. I, 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 as a business, you would just, because there's nowhere else to, to ply your trade as a referee, you're kind of stuck in the system. Maybe there's some sort of union answer there, you know? As, as a group of 28,000 individual referees, I'd say, yeah, sure, you're fucking powerless. Uh, if, if you shit on, you're just one of 28,000, you know? Uh, there's 28,000 other referees that, that they could call upon to, to referee games that you could do. Um, but let's think about it. If, if you did stand up, and there are referees, there are characters in the game who are referees that you know that they will put their head above the parapet. They will question everything. They'll be very vocal in big meetings and they're always shouted down, even if their points are like solid, if they're making solid points, if they're critical in any way, shape or form. 
they'll be shot down, they'll be marginalized, and they'll be put, you know, they'll be pushed out. That, we, I think it's, it's fair to say that the three of us, I'm not going to speak for you guys, but I've seen evidence of, of that happen, happening in the various counties that I've refereed in. And I'm sure people listening can, you know, attest to that sort of behavior as well. Um, I just, yeah, what what is the answer to it? I've never been. I, I, I've seen it. Do you remember the, the strike at Ryan Hansen? And yeah. that, when that got really big, there was a county FA, I won't say which one it was, stood up at a referee's meeting and said, if any of you go on strike, you won't be ready to referees next year. That's what. That's the sort of behaviour that is acceptable. When you hear David Ellery saying, no beards, no beer bellies, no tattoo, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are saying that? This is a sort of mentality why I feel some RDOs won't stand up, even though they know they want to do it, yeah. and they're all good people. I'd say all the RDOs I know, and I know an awful lot of them, I reckon there's four or five, I think, nah. You're not, you're not in that shop for the right reasons. And I think nearly all the others are genuine referee people, genuinely want to want to help, but they're just a little bit scared to really throw out the, the proper help that they that they, that they want to give because maybe someone upstairs doesn't want that to happen. And that's just sad. It's yeah, just sad. sad. It is. And, and, and I'm not just guessing, I'm just making this up. I'm going from comments we've got. And if someone wants to push me, I can prove it. I can, I've got the messages, I've got emails, I've got loads of stuff. I even had one RDO, right, which sent me loads of, loads of WhatsApps in private. And then I went back to, and it's all great, he was perfect, and I really, really helped him, no problems at all. And if he's listening, I want him to know that I found this out. That he then deleted all the uh, WhatsApp messages on, on it because he might, maybe he was a bit um, concerned that... Yeah, come back to Biden. Might, which I understand. I'm not going to have a go at him. But I understand that mentality because people will genuinely... We've seen it, all three of us, and Nathan is probably... You could probably... Let us know about the mental health challenges on this. Our people will say things non-publicly, either one-to-one or, or on social media. We'll never in a million years say publicly. I called some people. We had, I had this at the FA. We used to have meetings outside before we went into our coaches' meeting. And I hope some of these coaches are listening. And, and we'd be at the coffee machine, and they'd all be going, Hey, Scouts, we need to tell Neil Barry this. Hey, Scouts, we need to tell Neil Barry this. And David Ellery that. And Peter Ellsworth, we're going to stand up and tell them. You go in that meeting. Who was the only knobhead that said anything? Me. <laughs> Who was the only one that would go, hang on a minute? Me. These coffee machine warriors, they're the ones that are the problem as well. Yeah. They'll all and stand there and say, we're going to change the world. And when they get in front of a chance to change the world, they go, oh, no thanks. And whoever you, you know you are listening to this. And shame on you. Just shame on you. Well, I, look, I don't, I don't know any of the people that you know. Um, well, I, yeah, okay, well, I, yeah, I don't know those people. And I, and I don't, obviously, the, the situations that Ant described there, I, 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 I wasn't present at them and I, I don't really have, I've not been a member of a committee or anything, so I haven't really got anything to say on that. But what I will say is that, I, I, the, 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 what I feel about it is that and this, this this is not just football. This this is not just the FA. This is this is pretty much every institution in the world, in every industry in the world. You, you've you've got people who maybe are suffering with with mental health challenges that are feeling under pressure, that are feeling that they can't cope with the demands of the role, but don't feel that they can say anything because they have aspirations of more and they want to be, you know, they're they're a level four that wants to be a level three. There are you know whatever they, they are, and, and they feel that by letting anybody know that, that, um, that, 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 that they've then they've damaged their, um, their, their possibility of promotion. And, and I think that that's incredibly sad. Um, and, and thankfully, I know that in the majority of, um, well, yeah, okay, I'm going to say the majority of, my, of, 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 of the Clients we've had with the third team, the, the County Football Association, that's not the case because the RDO wouldn't work with us if that was the case because they wouldn't value um, mental health and things like that and they wouldn't value resilience and mental toughness and all the things that, that my workshops are all about because they, they would they would see it as a, as a deficiency and a weakness. So I'm lucky, but I know that people who, who've, not, who've you know, not wanted to have any involvement with with the third team, I, I can only presume that it, it comes from 
who where where they've specifically not said a, a reason. You know, I've had other people I said, oh, we're working with other people. And that's fine, not a problem. I'm glad that they're dealing with the problem more than anything and that they, they're supporting the referees. But where they've just said no and things like that makes me think that there's some sort of insecurity about the whole the whole thing and um, and there's an unease about it. And, and that's a real, real shame because I, I've had certain counties where they've just not literally put the phone down, but, you know, they've, they've tried to shoot you off. And, and, I, and, I, and my personal feeling is because they either don't see it as an issue or they don't want to tackle the issue or don't want to accept that there is a problem when it comes to some of the problems with the referees, mental well, well-being. I want to say that. Oh, go on. I'll, I'll just say that by by keeping the door closed to you is not allowing the door to open for any potential criticism of them. And if they are, like you say, insecure or they are aware of what they're doing, not wrong, but what could be done better, but they're not doing just just because it would be extra effort or for whatever. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of a protectionist kind of behavior of what they're doing. It's and you know it, it really it, it, you wouldn't have seen it because Nathan you're going to the places who oh you know welcome you in open arms do your workshops all that sort of stuff and it saddens me that there are county FAs out there that say not not oh you know we go with someone else the ones that say now we're just not interested we're, we're not asked we're not asked about the, the the mental well-being of 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 people under our our jurisdiction that that can, can you ah oh, it, it just it saddens me. That, that there are the people in the positions that would be able to affect good change for a lot of people that are just like, nah, can't be asked. Can't be asked. No, I, I, I think that's fair. I think I think it's it's I think it's fair and unfair a little bit. Because I don't I don't think anyone <laughs> genuinely just want to help someone's mental health. But I can see why you think that's so because like like uh, Nathan says, it's just it just, it just gets binned. Someone I'm too busy for that. But what I've seen it and it happens when we start to deficit support. Some idea was panicked. And I know this for a fact. We've said it at meetings and the friendly RDOs have told me they thought we were after their job. They thought ref support were created to do their jobs for them. Because let's be honest, let's just be dead state. Some of them, they, they just want to get registration in. They just want to get the numbers up. Yeah. I'm going to get them promotions and take the boxes. When it comes to real support, they haven't got the budget to do it. So when you have someone come along like Nathan, who's top throat, he could probably look at me in that. I'm probably a workshop on my own. <laughs> but I, you, 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 you know, and, and again, I said it before, we're, we're blessed to have Nathan here. And I think that um, some people might be intimidated by that, mate. I think, you know, we've had it before, though, people are going to ask, well, why? Why can't we do that ourselves? That's So they feel a little bit insecure. There's other ideas out there, and where's this developed? I'm sure we'll, we'll give them uh, shout-outs. we are top throw, have you in a flash, get a budget for, or maybe get a sponsor for the budget or whatever that will see how good you are at what you do and the benefit you give to referees on and off the field of the play. And but always make sure that there's going to be people out there I don't want to use you not because they don't care about mental health. They're scared of how they look. They haven't done it. And it's not their idea. That's what you're going to come up against. I mean, I've always tried to frame it as this is a partnership. This is me offering a service so you don't have to think about it. I'll come and do it for you, you know? And I think that that's the way that that, that I wanted to be. It, it's a positive thing, and I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't really. If that is the viewpoint of some of them that you've just described there, Martin, I, I don't want them to feel that way. You know, I want them just to say, "Look, I'm coming here. I'm offering the services. We can we can work together, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to to basically not need to think about that because I'll deal with it for you, and, and I'll bring my expertise and and everything I've I've learned, I'll put it all into it, and all my experience with the referee, and 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 we can do this for the referees, and it's something that you know you've taken care of because you've outsourced it, and it's not a problem, and and that's what, and I'm doing, and I personally think that um, they would the, 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 for them to to be given the referees that opportunity and those services is, is a wonderful wonderful thing, and and I think that it's something that really they should be applauded for whether it's me or whether it's someone else you know as long as they are looking after their people it's 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 absolutely a really really positive thing and I don't think it could ever reflect badly on them and you know and and whilst I I can understand that I can sort of understand their, their perspective on it 
I just think that it's it, it, that giving referees any help, technical or non-technical, doesn't matter. If, if you are giving referee support and you are outsourcing and bringing something extra in that you maybe couldn't supply yourself, you haven't got the time or whatever means, it, it, it can't. It can be can be nothing uh, but a wonderful thing. And, and of course, Martin and, and Aunt, you both know, having been involved with multiple different counties, that that some counties. The majority of counties have got the same, reasonably the same lot. Obviously, I know some have got more, more referees and some uh, smaller counties and, and so on and so forth. But it's the way that they use these resources and the way that they decide to partner with people and, and make these relationships. And, and that's that's why some referees have a better experience than other referees because of the county they're affiliated to. And, and usually that's, nine, well, I'd say probably maybe eight, nine times out of ten, that's your birthright. Where you're brought up is where you and it's what experience you get because of the, the county that you come from. Yeah, yeah fair point, mate. Fair point. Well, from, from mental health, I want to talk about physical health because I've not been in the gym for four months. And today I actually went into the gym, did 25 minutes of cardio, smashed the weights, boom. But I've heard a rumor, right, that the, the top refs, the PGMO match officials, have been banned from gyms. Nathan, right. what have you heard about that? Because that that is kind of where well, the rumor I've heard came from your direction. Well, I wouldn't say that I know anything about it, but I, yeah, certainly um, it's something that that um, uh, I might have seen a little bit of. Yeah, I think that um, I think that it's an interesting one, and and perfectly understandable in terms of the fact that I, I, you know I don't know who's shoulder the burden when it comes to the cost of all these tests that the, the PGM well officials have, have had to do over the past uh, probably six, eight weeks now. Um, and and I, I can understand it from that perspective. Um, I think it makes things a little bit more difficult. And, and as far as I'm aware, uh, maybe they haven't been given access to equipment that, that would normally find at the gyms that they would normally use in, in regular season time. Uh, but yes, um, I think that I can understand why such a directive would be made in, in terms of the interest of health and safety, but clearly it's going to make it more difficult. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, when the fitness tests come around, we'll see, um, we'll see sort of how people, how people, what, what, the way that the land lies with regard to, um, to fitness and, and condition. Well, I think, the, the, the people that I know who are on the, the PGMOL or I've been on the Premier League, they've all had really, really good uh, physical regimes of some sort. And most of the ones I know don't really use a gym. Most of them. Most of them I know. I think um, some of them do. I don't know why they... I've always wondered why the PGMOL haven't got some deal with, with a gym where they get half-price gym membership or something yeah. and then they promote them on the training kit or do something i don't know why the pgmo has never gone down there i'll probably just give them an income stream there without thinking about it <laughs> but like i don't know why they haven't done something with with that and then that they can advocate that gym and all the all the benefits that come to the gym can, can, can have but most of them get out on the roads get out on the park too but when i was on i used to do a brief test in a car park we used to go down to the a car park a leisure center down here and uh, we all used to line up and mark out the white lines on, on the car park and do the bleed test. It used to be a white crack, rain, you know, as long as it wasn't too slippery, we, we'd do it. And I think I, I'd be so, I could understand them saying why they would be banned from gyms because that might break any form of COVID bubble you've got, particularly mm. with the Premier lads. I would, I, I would dare say that's probably one of them. But I think um, if there was anyone, going back to the decisions when you said there'd be a reason for releasing the, the COVID advice late for the FA I would say there's, there'll be a reason for this if that is right not going to the gym and they'll validate it you know, I, it's, I wrote to Mike, Mike Riley he's got back and he's always open and honest and always had a, you know, a straight answer I think there'll be a legitimate reason that maybe we just don't know what goes on in that bubble yeah. remember we said at the beginning after being COVID tested the pair we got back and said well no we haven't we don't need to COVID test them yet when it becomes to doing games and we know when games are restarting then we'll COVID test them and we keep COVID testing them. Yeah. Even did it in fairness to the FA. They all even the playoffs are um, the National League North, South, and, and 
um, Premier, all the referees are COVID tested. Yeah. You all got sent two for the semis and then the lads for the um, final all got COVID tested too. So from that side of it, I think they've been great, the FA and that. But I would say it doesn't, when it's framed that way, so, you know, they've been told not to go, go to a gym. I don't think it sounds too good, but I'm sure that's got something to do with the bubble up here in there, mate. I wonder where yeah. else they're banned from as well then. Like, don't go Mackey's, don't go KFC, don't go the gym. Well, I think that there's probably the dietary reasons for that as well. <laughs> well, you'll take the money for the FA Cup of McDonald's and the challenge. Exactly, team. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But they won't do it. Yeah, they could be sponsored uh, by gyms like McDonald's. Yeah, David Lloyd's, Bannatine, all over them. But nah, yeah, no, just yeah, fast food. But then I think in all fairness, they've got a social conscience to have, and they, you know, the, the, the end of the day, if they'd been uh, as as Martin said, if they'd been testing them from day one when they didn't have any fixtures back in, then not only are they costing money to get the tests, but also they're taking tests away from you know frontline workers and people like that who really, really did need them at that particular time. So I think that yeah. in terms of all of this, there's, there's got to be a really wonderful social conscience. And I think that the PGML, the Premier League, the EFL, FA, everybody who's been involved in, in that professional and semi-professional level that we've seen the resumption of fixtures in the past six to eight weeks, I think they've all been absolutely fantastic really with, with what they've done and all the effort that's gone in to creating that, the, I said, the 100 metres uh, clearance around all the grounds and things like that. All the effort that's gone into that, all the effort that's gone into making everything safe. You know, there's been a lot of grounds in Goodison Park that were coming from two different directions, dressing room wise, where they, you know, in, in all the grounds where they could do that. I think it, I think it's been absolutely fantastic. And because, like we said, you know, when we were talking about the um, the guidance from the FA for grassroots officials, none of this is easy. You know, this is the first time that everybody's dealt with everything, and this is not easy. So I think that everybody involved, to use a to use a Steve Bruce term, for all concerned, I've got to congratulate them. <laughs> yeah, fair shout, mate. I, I think I don't think we can argue with that, but it's um, yeah, I, I think we could all be guilty, can't we, of, of, of working around the catchphrase? What do we call it? Or they send messages out? What is it? Dog whistle politics, isn't it? Where you, you say dog whistle politics is um. Show me age here. If you say something that you don't really hear, Trump's really good at it. He won't say it, but what he doesn't say is the dog whistle. Dog whistle policies where you think, oh. So yeah. next time when we come back on, Google dog whistle. Dog politics. whistle politics. And I think I think we'll all be guilty, guilty of doing that, picking out what we want from it to, to pick on. But yeah, let's, uh, let's give the FA benefits with regards to that difficult situation to deal with. The document seems... Good enough. I know we've took the Mickey out of it a little bit, but typical situation. But sometimes the straws that break camels back, and particularly putting this out so late, is just just wound me up a little bit. I just think that what we've got to hope for is, like I said, that you know, that the, 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 the powers that be are open minded to looking at how it goes over the first couple of weeks, where there's friendlies being played and things like that. And being open to making amendments and, and and maybe taking away things that are not possible and that are difficult and then adding things that referees are encountering that are potential issues and things like that. And as long as we're fairly flexible, you know, I think generally if you look in society at the moment, you can see that in some places they put local lockdowns on and they've pulled that lockdown back to be a bit tighter with the restrictions to make sure that, you know, everybody's safe. And I think that you would hope that with the policy around this, that there will be some flexibility too, where, you know, they might turn around and say, actually, this is something that is going fine. We, maybe, we can maybe discard that. That's not so much of an issue, but we're finding a new issue here. A lot of referees are reporting this to be an issue. So we want to get this involved. And, you know, potentially could be what you described just then, where we're talking about the, um, talking about the, you know, wiping the handle every time, um, the change hands, something like that, could be added to the to the guidance because referees are saying, "Well, I'm a bit concerned about that, or whatever it might be." So, well, the important part of having a living document with that is to make sure that it gets communicated every time it's changed. Yeah. And what yeah. we haven't seen is an efficient way of getting that out. Yeah. Well, everybody's on email, aren't they? Uh, and yeah. so, potentially, as long as everybody you know who subscribes to those emails gets them, there shouldn't be an issue. Usually, if you're going to be an active match official, you get appointments through emails, you get everything through emails. But you should be switched on to your emails, really, if you're a dedicated match official. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. But I, uh, the the email has to be sent in the first place. Is, oh, is yeah, kind of what I'm getting at there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The the method the, the, there is a very efficient method of getting that information out. The information yeah. just needs to be put out in the first mm-hmm. place. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. And social media is really, really good like that as well. You know, the yeah. the you know the FA referees department has got a social media on Twitter. Quite was quite active. They put stuff out. They've got an FA spokesman's got one. They put all the discipline out there. But they could have done what I done. Mm. You still haven't done it. I've just checked. They could have done that. Absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah. I'm just not buying that they could have done it. I I when they said it's only going to be sent, and you might have noticed me. I know those who are on, on radio. That I've been clicking in and out of stuff while I've been doing it. And I hope that's come across as rude because I've been reading some of the comments on the Facebook page when I've put that out there about um about that document. And and people are saying, Oh, I, I can't click on it if you don't know how to use a PDF on our website. When you click on a document, it changes pages. So people are panicking saying, No, can we have all the so some people are putting all the five pages up now on our uh, on our web on our web page. So you know, those sorts of problems would have been solved. If the FA just said, here's the link, have a read of it, get, get it on, get on it. But yeah. What happens? And I just, you know, I just don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Are people just, why they haven't just got that out weeks ago? Uh, really, and then like you said about, you know, what I brought up about, you know, washing the, the linesman's flag when they change linos, which you probably get more often in pre-season games than any other game because they'll have like loads of people that try and out. Left, right, and center. I, I'll do the hold you the line for 10 minutes and I'll then someone else will come on. You know, that's going to get changed hands an awful lot of times. That, yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, and there's no guidance on it. It just says, I just looked, it just says, uh, before and after the game, nothing about using it. You could have five different people use that, then the referee's got to grab that and take that on. You know, that's it's those sorts of things where if they give us enough time to get back to them and they could have go, no problems at all. Let's be honest, the FA are very good at saying we got things wrong. Just don't do it, is he? So that's the problem. That's the problem. And I think that's what that meeting would have been like on Monday. But that's a friendly audience to know with the RDOs. Or well, the RDOs, okay, I'll get back to you. Or stays in house, no problem. Now it's come out. Obviously, people aren't thinking of stuff like that. You want, mm-hmm. you know, the, wipe the ball. You know, have 10 balls at a game. Some of those football clubs can't afford to have five or six balls. It's true. Do you know what I mean? And then what, what you wipe it with? You know, we've got these balls now that are all slippy with fucking hand sanitizer and whatnot. So you're getting it back on the pitch and someone heads it. They've got alcohol in their eye. And you know what? And then you're going to think, you know, trust me, I'm in the game. I'm in the sports equipment game. Been in it for many years. Some stuff will damage a ball. Mm. Some some of them has got to dry out. You know, yeah, you've got like soft touch balls, which soft touch balls, interesting fact. Soft touch balls, those like spongy balls you see people using now, they they were brought in because the boots are so thin. When you kick a ball with the old non TPU, they wouldn't have to hit your foot. Yeah. So they sort of put put the cushion in on the ball. Do you know what I mean? And it dries a bit better and it's manufactured a bit better. But these TPU balls, if you wipe something on that, it could completely damage that ball. Some of the color on it or whatever. It's. Just, I mean, that's, I'm not saying that. Hours, I'm not saying that. Just yeah. give us enough time to analyze what you are sticking out. I think that, you know, they've obviously used a lot of equipment and, and one of the things is sanitizer for the balls at the top level. So there's absolutely no problem, for, in my opinion, I don't know I don't know what you guys think about this, in my opinion, there's absolutely no problem saying, by the way, on the Premier League and on the Championship, uh, we've used this for cleaning the balls. So if that's what you want to go out and get, then we know that works. It, it, I think that just stuff like that that could be really helpful for referees if they need to have any sort of uh, cleaning materials in their bags that they need to add to their bags. The first point on that, Nate, is uh, the balls they use in the Premier League and the Football League, Mitre, Nike. The Nike ball on the Premier League is part of the kit deal. You know, all tied in lovely, completely different ball, probably 80, 90 quid retail. You're not going to get a grassroots football team getting that. You're going to get a cheaper one. You're going to get a £20 maximum one. The Football League ones are, is, is Mitre, brilliant ball. The new Mitre Superflex, whatever they called it. Delta, I think, brought the Delta back, actually. The Mitre Delta. You can probably you can probably throw dynamite at that and it wouldn't happen. <laughs> some of the balls that these grassroots teams are going to have, some of the youth ones, they're probably eight pounds a ball. Some of the best matter now, they're going to damage. If you put alcohol on them, trust they're going to damage. Mm. So, you know, I just see the scenario of referee going, oh, clean the ball, put alcohol on, all of a sudden all the, all the colour gets smudged or whatever. You know, that's, you know, 
it's just, I know that sounds ridiculous, but I need people to know that us as a charity, and I'm sure us as a team agree, are conscious that referees should have had more time to analyse this. Yeah. Well, yeah, because obviously one of the first things that I think about actually when I'm just listening to you talk there is the fact that what's one of the first things you do before the game starts? You check the pressure of the ball. The ball yeah. yeah. And it says in that document, don't touch the ball. If you do, you've got to be with your feet. Exactly. So how are you going to know whether the ball's flat or not? And then they're going to turn and they're going to go ref, the ball's flat. And you're going to say, well, sorry, yeah. lads, I couldn't check it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's it's things like we're not saying the FA aren't in a typical position. We're not sympathising with them 100%. This should have been done at least a week ago so we could have these conversations and get it right with the level seven that's going out there to do his little game that he's been looking forward to for months. It's going to yeah. be a lovely weekend, stunning mm-hmm. weekend, where it's going to be, it's absolutely perfect. Yeah. Make it easy for them to feel comfortable, to mm-hmm. enjoy their game and yeah. come back to the game. That's a, that's a better game. Yeah, I'm moaning again, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that we're raising legitimate points because, to be honest, Martin, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have any problem at all in saying um, that one or two officials, because we are so used to, to doing games, we're just going to do something that we shouldn't do. Not deliberately, not to break any rules. For example, it's an instinctive thing that you would pick yeah. up the ball and check the pressure. So you're going to have to have a word with yourself to say, actually, I've got to remember, I can't do that. And, and it's just stuff like that, that if you're reading the guidance and you've got that little bit extra within you, you can, you can do it. I'll be a bit mischievous again because I like being mischievous. Oh dear. You probably noticed. What a great time to do rock, paper, scissors to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Nathan's face. Oh my God. He's shaking his head at me. <laughs> we did the rock, paper, scissors. Let me do it. <laughs> perfect. That's, that's perfect. a can of worms that you've just gone. <laughs> I love doing like that. You know what I mean? Don't have a coin. Don't worry about that. Let's bring in FIFA. Yeah, I have going to do an amendment to law five. We're in the cases where there is a worry about COVID. Uh, players are, it is acceptable to use rock, paper, scissors. Don't no comment, Your Honour. <laughs> and it, it turns out that coloured whistles actually transmit COVID less as well. So they've, they've gone and come in across yeah, the board as well. <laughs> We're in coloured boots next. Me. <laughs> you better not and I might I might oh, you're a naughty boy it's, if it's a friendly and then there's no one watching I might I might I might stick on some funky boots so with my funky whistle be, I don't know if you're both going out this weekend or not I hope, I hope I'm not I'm not, I'm not. I've uh, got my mum's birthday she's 60 happy, happy birthday mum yeah oh, happy birthday man. have you got one Nate are you going out for the game I haven't got a game. My first game's next Saturday on the 8th. Is it? Well, we don't talk to you before. Have a safe game. Hope we all enjoy it. And, um, and let's see what conversations we can have once we've started doing some games. And I've gone yeah. to watch a couple of coaches. There's even advice in that document about, you know, coaches going and, and what happens there. And That's because there's no spectators, is there? So I presume that they count the coaches as a spectator, potentially. And, and observers, you know, what happens there is... So there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of things that I think next time we'll talk, we'll, we'll have, have it. But um, I'd like to wrap up now. If that's all right, so. It's all good, babe. Uh, thanks for another great blog. I hope the people who listen and watch uh, get something out of it. Don't be scared to contact any of us. Nate at the third team. Yeah. Me at the uh, at the referees forum and us at refsupport.co.uk, and uh, and hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Definitely, yeah. Excellent stuff. Uh, Thanks very much for watching. See you on the next episode.